invitation to speak in the seminar and also for the introduction. So the title of today's talk is Proofs with Bound Generation Properties and Examples. Here's the plan for this talk. Uh, I will start with a brief survey of groups with bounded generation, and I would like to refer you for more details to my to the talk I gave in number theory seminar back in May, and the recording is still available. Uh, and then I'm going to show you some proofs. So among the first examples of groups with bounded generation, actually the first example was the group SLNZ where n is three or greater. The boundary generation property for that group was derived from the fact that, in fact, this group is boundary generated by elementary matrices. So, in other words, every universal matrix over Z and Z over any rings of integrated integers is a product of not more than some fixed number of elementals, which obviously implies the boundary generation property. That was the first result in that area. It was obtained by the former faculty members of Virginia. So David Parker and Gordon Keller. Uh, in fact, this happened even before the formal definition of groups with power generation was given. And one may wonder if one can extend this argument to other, let's say, Euclidean rings. And the answer is no. In fact, Martin Cullen in 1982 proved that if you look at the group SLN over the ring C box X, then this group uh, is not bounded in degree by elementals. This result is far less known than the result of Carter and Keller, so I decided to give you a sketch of the argument in this case. And then, time permitting, I will show you how, uh, show you a different technique for proving boundary generation for SX metric groups of classical types. Uh, if I uh, run short of time, then I'll be happy to share my notes with you. So please feel free to send me an email and I will respond to the notes. To get us started, let's recall the following definition. An abstract group gamma is said to have boundary generation property if there exist L elements gamma one for gamma d, not necessarily distinct, so that the group can be written as a product of the cyclic subgroups generated by those elements. And we have already seen uh, application of, of boundary generation in the analysis of first order rigidity. There are many, many other applications and because of time constraints, I will not be able to mention all the uh, contributors to that area. But initially, our interest was stimulated by the following two consequences SS rigidity and the congruence separate property. So let me go over this. We see that the group gamma is SS rigid if it has finitely many in equivalent, completely reducible complex representations in each dimension Z. Another way to put this is. Uh, to say, well, let's suppose that gamma is finitely generated, then for each D, we can consider the corresponding character variety. And the fact that gamma is SS rigid means that the, this character variety is zero dimensional for all dimensions D. Well, this simply means that there are no deformations of completely reducible representation. However, examples of such groups outside of course, uh, finite groups are not easy to find. In fact, most, known, maybe even all known examples come from lattices. And to justify the SS rigidity in those cases, one needs to appeal to such, to such fundamental results as one of the super rigidness. On the other hand, so let me show you an abstract result that is based on boundary generation property. So we have the following theory. Uh, 
Uh, let gamma be a group with Assume that gamma satisfies the following additional condition that I will call FAB for a common bus that states that every subgroup gamma one of gamma of finite index is finite. Then gamma is S S B. Couple of remarks. First of all, this condition is really necessary for SS rigidity, and then it would be a consequence of Rajdan's property T, of course. Another remark is that uh, in the proof, we actually rely not on the uh, bounded generation property for discrete group gamma, but rather for its profile completion. So it's really a profile. Another implication has to do with the congruence of the property. First, let me remind you of some uh, standard definitions. So suppose G, the, yeah, isn't absolutely Simple to play group over number field that's fix a faithful K defined representation. Now we fix a set of places. S of K that uh, contains all Archimedean ones. Well, let O of S you know the uh, ring of algebraic integers. And since we have fixed uh, a K divine plane, we can unambiguously talk about the group of S institute points. And then we are interested. In the congruence of a problem for gamma, namely, we would like to know whether every subgroup of finite index contains a suitable congruence subgroup. Now, for this, we introduce the congruence problem. So, this ideal answer to the congruence subgroup problem is really. Equivalent to the fact that the congruence kernel is uh, trivial, but we're also happy when the congruence kernel is fine. And then we have the following theorem, which was proved independently by Alex and by Platon and myself. Well, it 
includes some standard assumptions, which are that G needs to be simply connected uh, and satisfies so called Margulis Platonov conjecture, which is pretty much a theorem now, so you don't really need to worry about uh, these uh, assumptions. But the point is that if this arithmetic group has bound generation, then the confidence curve is done. And you can make it into an if and only if statement if instead of discrete bounded generation, you use the profile bounded generation. In other words, uh, C is uh, uh, finite, even only if the profile completion of gamma has bounded generation is a uh, profile. Now, at that point, we felt that this theory gives us a, a uniform approach to the quantum sample problem. In fact, there was word from Fritz Brunlot that he was able to use the computer to verify bounded generation for some protagonic groups. Well, I must say, and that the quantum sample problem for quaternion groups, for, for those groups that come from quaternion algebras, was and still remains open. And next week, Jim Goran will tell us what we know now about quaternion groups from the point of view of bounded generation. That's a joint work with Corvaya uh, and Daniel. And like I said, there are thousands of other applications. Uh, for example, Shalom and Willis used bounded generation to prove the so-called Margulis uh, Zimmer conjecture in certain cases. It was also used, for example, to estimate Cardan constants and so on and so forth. Again, sorry, I don't have the time to mention all uh, related results and, and the names of contributors. Is it okay to ask a question? But like this, uh, if and only if for, for finite, is it only for simply connected? Yes, because it's known that if the group is not simply connected, there is no finiteness. Ah. This yeah. is like from kind of a trivial reason that can be understood. You understand what is the kernel if it's not simply connected. And then Here's a simple explanation. So when uh, you, you pass from a simply connected group to a non simply connected group, the arithmetic topology doesn't change, but the congruence topology changes. That's if you take something like the metaplectic groups, it's a, you can understand. It. Uh, like yeah. yeah. So yeah, but I mean, there, there's a certain kernel there that you understand. That's right, not... right. So that was the computation of metaplectic kernel and so on. Yeah. But for that, we only need to know that the metaplectic kernel is really fine. Mm -hmm. Now, so the statement is that the theorem is an epinomial when G is simply connected. Yeah. It's if and only if the cofinite completion is boundedly generated. Yes, so let me put it that C of G is finite. Is it equal to the fact that gamma hat has boundary generation as cofinite? That's definitely not, we expect is not equivalent. <laughs> because, because, well, up to now it was not known, but because of the recent breakthrough that uh, Jim will talk about it next week, we know that our example of congruent sub property without bounded generation of the discrete group. Okay. What was, what was the relation with simply connectedness? Sorry. What's sorry? What was the relationship with simply connectedness? Between? I asked yeah. if it's uh, if and only. Only when it's simply connected, and they said it can be it's infinite, like the kernel is infinite when it's uh, not simply connected. But, yeah. okay. so the bounded I'm generation is not related to simply connected. So if you pass to the you know image, you still get simply connected. Oh, you still get bounded generation. 
But the implication for the confluence of the problem is related to simply connected. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, so if somebody is interested, I can give you, you know, the slides from my previous talk where more details are given. Because now I would like to sort of address the question about examples of groups with boundary generation. And as I said earlier, in fact, the first examples were discovered even before the formal definition was given. Carter and Keller were looking at the question posed by uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's keep my mind. So uh, yeah, Dennis, Dennis and what they're calling. They asked the following question. Take SLN of O, where O is a ring of algebraic integers. Take any uh, unimodular matrix. Can you reduce it to the identity matrix by finite by bounded number of elementary transformations? So this question was asked not with relation to the concrete supper problem on other applications that are asked, but uh, that was the, the, the thing. Of course, if you take, for example, SL2Z, there is no boundary generation because it's a virtually free group. So Van der Kallen and, and Dennis so asked, so what happens when N is at least three? And it was the question was asked, I guess, in 1978, but then in 1983, Carter and Keller came up with that theorem that really tells us that if you take a ring of uh, algebraic integers or S integers, then SLN over that ring uh, has bounded generation. Uh, in fact, the same is true for SL2O, but not in all cases. Obviously, the case where the ring is like Z or the ring of integers in the quadratic field, then there is no boundary generation. But we proved uh, a couple of years ago that if the group of units of the ring is infinite, then we have boundary generation also for n equals two. Okay. Should I continue? So as I said, so now let me give you a sketch of the proof of the common fact that SL and Z is boundedly generated by elementary. The first step is quite elementary. It states that given any matrix in SL and Z, it can be reduced to a matrix of the shape A, B, C, D by a bounded number of. Elementary row and form So it's enough to prove that any matrix of this shape. Can be reduced inside SL3. Here I'm really talking about three by three matrices uh, to the identity matrix. Inside SL3. Oh. 
the proof hinges, the proof hinges on the following property. Right, what is it? That is called bounded multiplicativity of many symbols. The following given a matrix of that shape, and then for every integer L, you can pass from the L's power of that matrix to this matrix. By 16 elementary operations. But now the proof is purely computational. Is that B prime, C prime, B prime? It's different. B, C yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes, thank you. Because many symbol really depends on just the first row. Now let's write down the effect of one uh, elementary transformation. Because <laughs> A and B are co prime. So here we have arithmetic progression. So using Dirich list, we can assume that B is an odd prime. In fact, uh, applying Dirich list twice, you can take this one step further, namely. You can assume that A is actually of the following form. Where P and Q again are all primes, such that the GCD of P minus one over two, comma, Q minus one over two is one. If so, we can pick integers M and N. And let me call the first number uh, S and the second number T. Now let's look at the matrix A to the S. That's our S, then by the bound multiplicity of the uh, matrix symbol, it takes 16 elementary operations to transform your matrix to the matrix of the form. Uh, by the mass, Little Fermat here, of course, this is congruent to plus or minus one mod p. So applying one more transformation, we can reduce this to something like plus minus one. What is that? A to the S? Yes. 
this is s. Oh, that's about oh, sorry. So it's almost p minus one. So it's p minus one over two. So the result could be either plus or minus one over two. Okay, and then obviously you can create zero over here, kill this p, and so on. You are basically done. That means it's obviously a product of a bounded number of elements. Okay, that's a to the s. How, how do, does this help? Well, You can take the transpose of your matrix A and then this Q, yeah, it was like that. You can take the transpose and then you'll put Q in that position, okay? And then you can raise to the power T and play the same game. So uh, let me say that. Thus, a to the s is bounded. Okay. Now, then you take the transpose, which will place q into that uh, top right corner and place it again with S replaced by T. And then you can transpose back and then see that A to the T is also about it. And then from that equation, we'll of course see that A to the S uh -huh. Minus a to the t inverse is about the but that's nothing but a or b inverse. That's how you get your matrix. Uh, a written as a bounded product. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. Can I ask? It looks like uh, along the way one can follow how large are uh, the given the the uh, entries of A. How large are the elements which appear in the elementaries? Yeah, that's uh, a good question. But we, we do not. Know. This is a long arithmetic progression or something like that, but let's assume whatever needed from number theory, what I, I, I guess people have computed what's the bound that you get? No, we don't have a bound, so it becomes quite large because there are estimates on the smallest prime in the progressions, going back to Lydic and so on, right. but that, that's not exactly what happens. So there is no, for example, polynomial bound. We don't know that. In fact, we expect that the answer should be negative. I can explain the reason a bit later. What so, means, yes. Sorry, what? It's non. What, what do you mean? There is no. Again, we don't know. It's not true that it's polynomial in the entries. It's not that the, the, really expect. Or you expect it not to be polynomial. Right, the, right. That's what we expect. Again, there, is no, there is no proof either way. No, there is no proof, but. Uh, we would like a reasonable bound. So we would like a bound on the number of elementaries and like polynomial bound on the entries of, of those elementaries. And which, kind of, which kind of bound one can prove assuming whatever number theory you want, like, you know, any any good conjecture. Riemann hypothesis, generalized hypothesis. What kind of bound, not polynomial, but what can be proved? Well, if you use Linux, so it's like super exponential, so exponential to exponential. Double exponential? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. yeah I mean, you shouldn't expect this to be polynomial because you're making an exponential. No, no, I understand. I don't expect, I expect polynomial. I'm just wondering. No, uh, it's an ex actually an excellent project for undergraduate to do some experimentation. <laughs> for example, take 
all matrices with entries up to let's say a hundred and look at their factorizations is there a bound so unfortunately uh, the computer usually runs out of memory so we don't have experimentation so even though i asked why well, you mentioned fritz grunewald doing experiments have you did you ever see them he never showed me anything Okay. No, I mean, uh, you know, he claimed at the time the quaternion seems. Yeah, right, right. So he had obviously what he thought were bounded generators uh, uh, numerically. Yeah. yeah, in fact, I asked him a different question. So, about, you know, the committed subgroups of the congruent subgroups. This has to do with, you know, PAD analytic groups. And he said that he had uh, big tables of these things. And the size of that quotient was the right one so but that was during my last meeting with him i think it, it was in, in vienna and after that so i didn't have any communication with him that's that's the way it is but still you can ask you know different questions about the groups and in some cases uh like pro p completions can be proved to be uh theoretic analytic but that's the best we know about the groups now Okay, can I continue? Uh, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, is there any intuition for why this, these 16 transformations give you what you give you? Like no, the, the, there is no you know, meaning to that, I guess. So it's, you take the argument for the multiplicativity of many key symbols and just go through it and showing that in fact, only bounded number of transformations is needed. Right. It turns out to be 16, but it's just a computation with polynomials. There is no, you know, deeper meaning. I see, but how did people find that? Like, did people use a computer to find these 16 ones or like, was it just no, by- it was done by, by Miniki in like 1960, pro probably two or three, there, there were no computers then. I see, okay. So the, the proof was found, I mean, it's basically the same. And he proved the congruent subgroup probably first. Uh, okay, and you yeah. to compute with matrices. <laughs> I mean, he proved, he was the first, I think, to, even yeah. prove any case of the congruence for yeah. SL3Z. Mm -hmm. so, uh, right. Right. And he obviously <laughs> invented this, you know, without the computer. How okay. he came up with yeah. this, I don't know. Okay. Right. And and this is for SL3, right? For SLN, is it like similar? Like oh, you reduce yeah, but, um, but like oh. I said, you always reduce N to three over any dedicated ring. And I, I'm going to mention this later. Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So because it's the ring, the stability starts at three. That's but okay. Thanks. Now again, uh, it's an excellent question that whether you can do something over more general rings. So we did use some number theory, like Jewish list, for example, and you know, Fermat theorem. Now the question is, can you do something similar over general, let's say Euclidean rings? Okay. And very interesting is the answer turns out to be negative. And it was actually discovered before the first uh, uh, result of Carter and Keller appeared. And it was done by Van der Kallen in a small note published in lecture notes from some key theory conference. So it somehow didn't attract as much attention as Carter's and Keller's work. So let me now, in the remaining time, try to show you that quite clever argument of Van der Kallen. You write the name down. Huh? I didn't get the name. Can you write it down on the board? Yes, of course. By the way, this works very well, this interaction. I mean, they're really, uh, we're way ahead of the world. <laughs> yeah, we are. No, we're interacting with him very well. You just talk softly in this room, you hear? Very good. Mm. Now he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I just spoke too quickly. Don't give compliments. Yeah. Are you there, Andre? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that works fantastically. Like it, but... 
because it reacts to the noise. So when you say something, it goes to you. It says that there is no end such that every matrix in L uh, M equals X is a product of not more than 10 elements. Because the truth doesn't have bubble generation, it cannot have bubble generation because it's un uncountable. But we would like to follow the same pattern as for C, namely ask the following question. Uh, is this group boundary generated by elementals? And that's what Wonder Column proved, and I'm going to show you, at least in our sketch. Uh, now, what's the significance of C? What is used as the proof is the fact that C has infinite transcendence degree over the prime subfield. So it's true, uh, for example, you can take Q and join countably many variables and then put polynomials on top of that. This group doesn't have boundary generation by elementaries either. So this is still open for SLN QX? I suppose so. There is another question that we're currently looking into with Jinbo. So over the integers, when you localize, then usually it acquires boundary generation. Now you can ask what happens if you replace C box X by the Lorentz one? And apparently this question was not addressed. So we have some hope that we can do, uh, we can show that this group doesn't have boundary generation either, but it's still work in progress. So I will, I will show you the argument only for usual polynomials. Okay. Now, the argument is based on some properties of K2 factor. So let me remind you of what this is. So suppose R is a commutative ring. Then we can literally embed GLN into GLN plus one, so on. And the direct limit of this sequence will be denoted just G L. Also, for each n, we can consider E and R, which is the several generated. And again, we have a similar sequence, and this limit is not right. And we have the following famous result, which is called Wagner's lemma. Says that actually E of R is precisely the point of the And moreover, the group E of R is perfect.
So the motion is then an ideal group, which is by definition in one of them. But this is not what we are after. Uh, see, this statement says that the elementary group is perfect, and therefore it has a universal central extension. Now, the upper group is called the Steiner group, and then the kernel of this universal extension is D by D. Now, the Steiner group actually has a more constructive description. So first observe that uh, you know elementary matrices satisfy the following communication relations. If uh, G equals K, <clears throat> and the symmetric one these are the, the some of the relations that we need to impose. Uh, in SLM or a elementary program. Then the standard group uh, can be described as a group generated by elements. I J tilde and lambda. So which are the doubles of the elementary matrices and subject to the following relation. The following formulated relations. And I will not write these relations are exactly the same as on the left part of the blackboard. Well, of course, we use e, e tilde in place of, of E. And then our universal extension is obtained by sending the IG to a tilde to just the IG. Okay. Are there any questions?
These tildes were just arbitrary lifts. Sorry, I, I missed that. What? These tildes are just arbitrary lifts to the universal central extension. Sorry, I, I can barely hear you. I said these tildes, these e, EIJ tildes, they're just arbitrary lifts. No, no, it's not lifts. no, no, they're just abstract generators. Finished yes, they're lifts. Yes. But these are just abstract. So for each i, j, and lambda, you introduce a symbol, which is called uh, e tilde of i, j. Oh. At this point, they have no meaning. These are just abstract generators for, for standard. Oh, OK. okay. Yes, of course, they are lists, but they are very special lists, and I will use this later. But for now, it's just abstract symbol. Okay. Now, let me mention some stability results of these. So remember, we define that this k1 and k2 using the infinite dimensional groups. But in quite general situations, so we can do better. In fact, uh, Often happens that the elementary group is a normal subgroup of G L M R. Okay, and then the quotient of G L M R. You have to assume something for that, not what? Yeah. What? 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 This you have to assume something for that, I guess. No, yes, of course. I will mention this. Yes, I'm just trying to explain what it means to have stability. So, oh. what happens is that if n is large enough, he's explaining stability, then this will be a normal subgroup. Uh, and then you can look at the quotient, which is called k1. N of R. But obviously, there's a map from K1 N of R to K1 of R. And in many situations, it happens to be an isomorphism. So we see that the stability holds starting with some variable like 5. If even if E5 is normal in GL5 and the quotients are isomorphic, then we see the stability. And like I said, it's quite general phenomenon. So, for example, if the ring is, uh, uh, let's say, commutative in Syria of full dimension D, then the stability starts with. D plus three actually. Now, if your ring is dedicated, actually you can do better. So then D of course equals one, but the stability starts with three, not with four. And again, you have stability also for P2 in the same range. And I just mentioned this because it's convenient for me to be able to switch between the infinite dimensional. Uh, Genial linear group and the corresponding definition of K2 and the finite dimensional at some dimension. Is, is this stability hard to see? Yeah, it requires some work. You can find this in Bess's book in some form, but then um, the, among the contributors were Van der Kalden, uh, Dennis, and you know other people, Stein. It's not a, it's not a trivial result. Now, what do we mean by stability for, for, for K2? Well, we can, for A and greater than equal to 3, we can define standard in dimension L. 
Again, you use the same uh, generators and the same relations, but not for all i and j, but for our i and j up to n. And then in the same range, we, we have the uh, let's see. Next, I need to tell you how to uh, generate elements in K2. Remember, we have this extension, which is a universal central extension. How can you possibly construct elements in K2 by some explicit procedure? Well, one idea which is almost obvious is the following. So you can take uh, any two conditions elements in the elementary group, take their lists, A tilde and B tilde. And take their commutator. Well, this obviously creates an element. Now, a very nice fact uh, regarding this is that this element does not depend on the choice of lists. So, because other choice would differ by a central element. So the community is going to be the same. And to create uh, special elements in K2, which are called symbols, you take the following elements, diagonal matrices. Which obviously commute downstairs, you take any two lists to standard, and then this uh, the community that gives you an, uh, an element of, of K2. Now, this element is called the standard symbol. Now, what do you think of the symbol as a map And this map satisfies the following properties. Is there some expression you made it using three by three matrices? Uh, yes, but this, you, you embed it into you know infinite dimensional thing. And okay. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, maybe I should write it using infinite dimensional matrices, but it really lives inside standard three. Okay. So it has the following properties. One is biomultiplicity and skipping it. Second, you have the following information for any unit. And you have one more, which is very important. Uh, whenever both u and y minus u are units. Oh, 
Okay, we have introduced uh, symbols as commutators. They can also be introduced as co-cycles. But then you need to pick not arbitrary lists, but very specific lists. Here's what happens. For any unit, you one well, can introduce the following standard matrix, which is Yeah, we're already talking about the following. And then we can introduce this. It really gives you The diagonal matrix. So these are the ways to write the diagonal matrix as a product of elementary. So it takes six elementary to write the diagonal matrix. And now using that factorization, we can define canonical lists of these elements and these elements up to Steinberg. So we simply just mimic those formulas to define Also, we set a RG uh, of U is going to be and then that shows that H and G filter of U times B. So then u comma b is really the tuple cycle that corresponds to our central extension. The h i j t, right? That's a formal definition. Oh yeah. Everything is good now. And let me remind you the famous result of Matsumoto. That for a field F, P2 of F is simply generated by symbols U. Just again, think about those as just formal generators. So it's generated by those elements and then by relations as follows. So we just require by, by multiplicativity. And two, the following very famous standard relation. Describes K2 with you. About U and minus U? What? Uh, 
What about you and minus you? It's swallow somehow? Well, that's, that's a consequence. For K2, I feel it's enough just to impose these two. U comma negative U equals one is a consequence. Now, let me see the results from K theory that we need for the proof of Van der Kallen's theorem. First. Oh, let uh, F be a field and N be a B3. There is a function such that is a product not more than n canonical generators, by which I mean is e tildes. Then x is a product of not more than m of m symbols. So, boundary generation with respect to one gives you boundary generation with respect to symbols. Okay. And this follows from really the proof of real composition in the standard group, which is given in uh, Miller's book on no, 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 hold on. I don't understand. What, uh, if, what, what are the canonical generators you refer to? So, this. E so if X can be written as a product of at most and canonical generators and also lies in K2, then it can be written as a product of a bounded number of symbols. So there is a certain rewriting process from canonical generators uh, you know, to, to give you a periodic composition, and then you can keep track of the number of symbols that you get that gets added at every step. Alex, is, is this okay? Yeah, this function little f depends on the on the field f. No, I mean it's a formal process. I think it's something like a linear function, really. But so it does not really depend on f. It's no, a formal. Uh, it's purely formal, so. That's one result. Second. Again, okay, suppose that is a field and we have a reading into F box X. Then this invention reduces an isomorphism. That's uh, the so called homotopy stability. And this is exactly where the argument doesn't work for Laurent polynomials, because for Laurent polynomials, there is no isomorphism. There is one extra term. And yet another fact is that F be a field infinite ensembles. 
Then P two of F does not have power generation with this step. This is proved using evaluations. Okay, now we're ready for the proof. So we'll, I hope to do it in the remaining 10 minutes. Are there any questions about these results? I mean, I'm unable to prove this on the spot, but all these facts are proved. Now, here's the formal proof. Now, for every element A and F, we can consider uh, the evaluation of all of this. The proof leads to standard groups. Standard groups are factorial. So if we have an element A in the standard and it is a product of canonical generators, then it gets sent to the product this thing is again. And we will probably denote this by Now, uh, fix an element uh, S in F. And consider the following matrix. Now it depends on S, but then we'll specialize it. It's a long product, and I can write uh, a couple of factors for you. But in order to save time, so let, let me uh, tell you what happened. So now we can take the canonical list and by canonical list, I mean the following. So we write this as a product of uh, elementaries this way. And then instead of each of those, we just put it in. That's what I mean by, by the canonical list. Again, what's the point? The point is that you write this, which is six terms, I guess, that if you specialize this matrix in zero, you are going to get actually H12 of S2. That's why you have this, all these factors, so that's the right way. Now, if you specialize this at one, you get just everything collapses and you get a single canonical generator. That's how this matrix is chosen. Next, you take two elements and then you can consider the following matrix. Andre, what is written there? A S tilde one is equal to what? Uh, you remember that no, no. Uh, line, the line below that A S tilde of one. Yeah. 
is equal to what h one to tilde of what? what that's, that's e. That's e. Sorry. So that's e. So when you specialize at zero, you get this diagonal matrix, and when you specialize at one, you get. Yes. Uh, but uh, e one tilde, uh, we are of what? What is inside the bracket? Times f minus one. F minus one. S times S minus one? That's two. S minus one. Yeah. Two S minus one. Actually, it doesn't matter. So we'll see that it doesn't matter, but what's important that it's a single elementary. Now we take the following. See where I'm getting? So this gives me this diagonal matrix. So when I do things like that, that's how I compute the full cycle, basically. So uh, we'll look at B, S, T, so that of X is the canonical list. B, S, T. Well, it's going to be an S, A, S, T, tilde, A, T, X, tilde. Again, what's the point? The point is that now if you specialize this thing at zero, you get this symbol, S, T. And if you specialize at one, you're going to get still a single element. Finally, we're using theorem three that tells us that there is no bound uh, on single length in K2. So we can choose elements S1, T1 up to Sm, Tm. So that the product of symbols cannot be reduced. We can do this because the symbol length is done down. And finally, let's look at the matrix Cm of x, which is the product of this. This was used in the previous thing. And what we're saying now is the following. We should complete the proof. There is no M such that CM of X can be written as a product. Of not more than n elements. Oops, we lost the ball. Uh, he has to talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, fantastic. It's whoever talks, it goes straight to you. So <laughs> it's quite cool. You need to talk, Andre. Andre, say something, otherwise we can. Yeah, yeah. I will come on again. <laughs> again, we look at the canonical lists. Okay. First, I 
define you know, A tilde, now B tilde, and then C tilde. Now, by the way, we constructed that matrix, we see that actually CM at zero specializes as a product to the product of, of symbols. While at one, it specializes to a single element. And I can write down the element. On the other hand, suppose CM of X uh, is a product of M of M elementaries. I don't want to introduce in this, I will just write U. Then, of course, when we I'm about to finish, so let's look at the list of that matrix. These are really some A, I, G filter. See, we have one lift, and then we have another lift of C. What's the difference? The difference is some element in K2. Right? Now, what's difficult, in fact, impossible to control is this thing. But here we use the homotopy stability. Namely, S is actually independent of X. Okay, so this means that if we specialize at uh, let's say one inverse and then on the left we will have uh, that amounts to one elementary. That one gives us the product of symbols. Now, what are we going to have on the right? So we specialize this first at zero and then at one. So this will be a product of two M elementaries. First, this guy specializes at zero, and this guy specializes at one. So, in other words, what we see is that the product of those symbols is a product of not more than like two n plus one elementaries. And that's almost the end of the story because we know from proposition, I guess, two that if an element in K two is written as a bounded product of canonical generators, okay? With, and this number is fixed. Then it should be written as a product of a bounded number of symbols. But that's not the case if we let M, the number of symbols go to infinity. Because since there's no bound on symbol legs, okay? When M goes to infinity, then by, by our choice, the less goes to infinity. On the other hand, the right hand side is of fixed lengths in terms of canonical generators. So it should be of fixed lengths with respect also to symbols. That, that's a contradiction. Well, I have, I have to stop. So thank you for your attention. Are, are there questions? Uh, I have one question. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, so all you need is the field that have infinite transcendence degree over the prime field, right? Yes. Said. So p-adic fields would work. Uh, yes, yeah, that's an excellent point. You can use this. If you ha ha have a bound
about on the degrees of the polynomials in the elementaries. You yeah. can also use the density of two in QP and yeah. play the same argument. Uh -huh. So, Does anybody know what, what happens if you replace QP by ZP, the p-adic integer? Same thing. Okay. Because we have infinite transcendence degree. Oh, okay. So Perfect. what we can say, if, if we take SL and Z box X, mm -hmm. then there is no, there are no two bounds. I mean, you want to put a bound on the length and no. on the degrees of the polynomials, like we said, like, in fact, you can use any function, not just polynomial. That doesn't exist. Huh. Okay. Now you said that it was hard to replace Z, uh, C bracket X by the Laurent polynomials, the C bracket X comma X inverse. That's what we're looking at now. So when I started doing this talk, I told Jimbo, so let, let's look at this. So uh, we have been working on this like maybe five days or something, but. Does that get into these nil group things? Is that involved? No, I mean, the thing is that one of the facts that I used was the, you know, homotopy Uh-huh. Remember, I needed to cancel this S. Right. Now it is known that P2 of X, X universe is actually P2 of F plus P1 of F. Uh huh. Right. I see. But we don't know. I mean, we need to see it. It should be too complicated that it's sort of embedded into P2 in a sort of bounded way. That's the only place. In the proof I gave you, which doesn't work for okay. for Lorad, but we're hopeful that you know we can figure this out. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>